Hey everyone, welcome to Neuropod. My name is Ryan Tanaka, and we'll start this episode with a clip of Kernel founder Brian Johnson talking about how Elon Musk considered joining Kernel before he started Neuralink. Elon and I spoke about this a lot early on. We, we met up, I had started Kernel, and he had an interest in brain interfaces as well. And we explored doing something together, him joining Kernel. And it, ultimately, it wasn't the right move. And so he started Neuralink, and I, I continued building Kernel. After going to University of Chicago's Booth School of Business, Brian founded a company called Braintree. This company was focused on enabling companies to shift towards mobile commerce by processing payments. The company was acquired by Venmo in 2012 and was eventually bought by PayPal for $800 million. Getting to this point, however, was not easy. Brian had a wide variety of life experiences and struggles that led him to this point. Here's a clip of him discussing some of the challenges that he faced. So over the next 14 years, uh, fortunately, that happened when I sold Braintree, but not without going through a a level of hell that, was, that, was indescri- that is indescribable. I, I can, became chronically depressed for 10 years and just literally wanted to cease to exist. It was an absolute unbearable existence. And on the hills of that, uh, I sold Braintree. I ended a 13-year marriage. Uh, had to re my, myself as identity with three children. I um, left my church my, my, uh, that I was born into and reconstruct myself from scratch and basically answer questions like, why do I exist? Is there anything out there? What's this whole thing about? After growing through these struggles and re-architecting himself from scratch, Brian decided to start focusing in on helping humanity thrive. His conclusion was to start Kernel. The outline for this episode starts with more background of Brian Johnson. And next, we'll highlight key metrics, followed with discussion about how Neuralink compares to Kernel. And we'll wrap it up with an overview of Kernel's current products, Flow and Flux. Brian is a fascinating individual with a wide variety of life experiences. Here's a clip of him discussing his realization that everything in society is a function of our brain. And I asked people, like, what are you working on and why are you working on that given thing? And I was doing so to back into their assumption stack. If I choose X, Y, or Z, the following is going to happen. And the blind spot that I perceived that existed was that everybody was working on problems downstream from the brain. We don't have a climate change problem. We have a human brain problem. It is our brains individually and collectively which creates this problem and creates the problem we have in the world. How we build AI is an output of our minds. How we create economic systems is an output of our minds. Our political systems is an output of our minds. But no one thinks about the mind as the core operating system that runs everything else. The core idea of being better able to understand the brain is a constant theme in Brian's public talks. If we want to improve the current status of human society, we need better tools to truly understand our flaws. Here's another clip of Brian speaking at Startup Grind Silicon Valley in 2016, giving an early description of Kernel. Yes, a Kernel is... I is a human intelligence company. And we are trying to work on, build the world's first neural prosthesis for cognitive repair and improvement. And so I arrived at this company because, again, back at the age of 21, I wanted to figure out what I could do that would benefit humanity. And so if you pull yourself back a million miles from Earth and you look at planet Earth and you say, what will become of us on planet Earth? I think the most important factor is intelligence, that we've never had the ability to increase our intelligence in the way we do today. And so we've always worked on intelligence. For example, we had stones, and then we built more sophisticated things like uh, thermostats, where it took over a part of our decision control. Then we built calcu- we have calculators, and now we have AI. So our tools are becoming increasingly sophisticated in what they can do for us. But humans, like we're just as smart as we were 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago, we just have smarter tools. But humans, relative to our other tools of intelligence, is a landlocked island of potential. And so the idea behind Kernel is that we can find a way to not only repair cognitive function in neurodegenerative diseases and help people live more fulfilling lives, mental vibrancy, but we can also create an entry point for which we can actually work on our own intelligence. Kernel is a neuroscience company that specializes in creating brain recording technologies. 
The company website includes this paragraph indicating the why behind their development. It says, quote, at Kernel, our primary goal is to enable improved and accelerated insights into the human brain. The 20th century was the century of physics. We split the atom, went to the moon, and peered at the edges and origins of the universe. The 21st century will be the century of the brain, the mind, and of general intelligence. What wonders lie ahead on the path towards the next great frontier of human exploration? Ourselves? Kernel is similar to Neuralink in that the primary founder is also the primary funder. According to Crunchbase, Brian's committed $54 million to Kernel. Additionally, they've raised $53 million from other investors. The company was started in 2016 and currently has around 100 team members. In this clip, Brian discusses credentials from this team. I mean, at Kernel, we are from the photon and the atom through the machine learning. We have just under 100 people, I think it's something like 36, 37 PhDs in these specialties, in these areas that there's only a few people in the world who have these abilities. Mm -hmm. And that's what it takes to build next generation, have to make an attempt at breaking into brain interfaces. And so we'll see over the next couple of years whether it's the right time or whether we were both too early or whether something else comes along in seven to 10 years, which is the right thing that brings it mainstream. The brain machine interface space is too early in development to know whether the invasive surgery approach or the non-invasive wearable device approach is the best. I've heard this debated countless times and my personal favorite answer is Brian's. I love how Brian thinks about BMIs on different timescales. It's too, I think it's too early to assess which technological choice is the right one on what timescales. Yeah, Be timescales are really important here. Very right? important. Because yeah. if you look at the, like on the invasive side, there's so much activity going on right now of less invasive techniques to get at the neuron firings, which what, what Neuralink is building, it's possible that in 10, 15 years, when they're scaling that technology, other things have come along and you'd much rather do that, that then starts to clock again. It may not be the case. It may be the case that Neuralink has properly chosen the right technology mm -hmm. and that that's exactly where they wanna to be, totally possible. And it's also possible that the paths we've chosen are non-invasive fall short for a variety of reasons. It's just, it's unknown. Going back to Code Conference in 2017, Brian opened with these remarks. Hi everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Johnson, and I would like to put a chip in your brain. Later in the talk, he shared why working on this technology is essential to solving our current problems and why it could be revolutionary. He also shared his personal story and inspiration. His stepfather was diagnosed with early symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, and his dad struggled with drug usage for the first years of his life. Brian himself had chronic depression for almost a decade. He wondered then, if we could read and write our neural code, could it be possible to eliminate all of this? In the same talk, Brian also envisioned some of the things that could be possible in the coming years thanks to technologies such as BCIs. Here's the clip. Let's imagine that we have chips implanted in our brain that we can read and write neural code at a fashion that gives us the ability to do a bunch of things. So what if we could walk a mile on someone else's mind? He followed with other what-if questions. What if we could feel the ocean, the forest, and the honeybee? What if we could live history instead of just read it? What if we could communicate telepathically with a new language that is 100 times richer in conveying thought, emotion, and experience? What if we could internally channel the genius of a writer, scientist, or artist? These are some questions that caused Brian to start Kernel in the first place. I believe Kernel, Neuralink, or some other brain interface company will make this possible in the future. And that is quite inspiring. Speaking of Neuralink, here's what Brian had to say when comparing the results of Kernel's approach versus Neuralink's approach. The Kernel flow uh, is going to give you a full screen on the picture of information, but so you're gonna be watching a movie, but the image is going to be blurred and the audio is gonna be muffled. So it has a lower resolution of coverage. A kernel Flux, uh, our MEG technology, is gonna give you the full movie in 1080p. Yeah. And Neuralink is gonna give you a circle on the screen of 4K. Yeah. 
And so each one has their pros and cons, and uh, it's give and take. It's important to note that Neuralink is also working on writing neural code. So to extend the example Brian gave, Neuralink would not just enable watching a circle in 4K resolution, but also writing information to the brain. For example, if a part of the motor cortex had a damaged connection to a limb, it could be possible to repair that broken connection to a level similar to prior to the damage. With Kernel's current products, Flow and Flux, it appears this is not possible. In this clip, Brian introduces Kernel Flow, a wearable, non-invasive headset that captures brain information. You will also learn that Kernel Flow captures 1,000 times more information than comparable systems on the market today. However, this dramatic performance improvement is just one variable underlying why flow represents a step function change. It's also about closing the effort and time gap. For example, if you want knowledge about what you're eating, nutritional labels are accessible within a glance. If you want to know your temperature, thermometers enable immediate knowledge. If you want a precise heart rate measurement, just look at your wrist. But what if you want high quality information about your brain? Say you have a question about your brain's health or cognitive wellness, or you want to improve something about yourself. Outside of a visit to the emergency room, it will take you literally weeks. Our goal is to make it so that you have immediate access to your own brain so that anyone, anywhere, can glean valuable insights about the inner workings of the thing that makes you, you. You might be wondering how this is possible. The company released a technical paper describing the technology behind Flow. The device uses a technology called Functional Near-Infrared Spectroscopy, or TDF-NIRS for short. The TD part is a technique called Time Domain that yields more information than current alternatives and has less instrumentation complexity. It's a non-invasive imaging technique that measures changes in hemoglobin concentrations within the brain. In this clip, Catherine, a member of the Kernel team, shed some light on how this approach works. We can take advantage of the fact that the brain has many blood vessels that supply oxygen to the neurons, and then when neurons use oxygen, the color of the blood shifts away from reddish and toward blue. Kernel flow shines light at the blood in the brain. The light bounces around in all directions, and by chance, some light will bounce back through the skull, skin, and back out of the head. We then use the amount of light we can detect and how it changes over time to calculate how active a nearby brain region is. The modules send photons via lasers to the surface of the head and then measure the oxygen concentrations over the surface of the brain from the photons that were reflected. It then estimates the neural activity over some parts of the brain at 200 hertz. This is a great feat of engineering. Here's a clip of Brian at CNS Summit in 2020 with Amir Kalali explaining the main working principle and the improvements relative to current systems. But there's 52 of these modules that uh, tile the head. So you have a full head coverage. Each one of these modules has a, a source, so a laser with uh, two frequencies. And then these are detectors. So uh, they're picking up the photons when they come back. And to give you a, a data point on the, the level of improvement we've made, most state-of-the-art systems today that have a similar technology will collect something like a thousand photons or, or a million photons per second. So you pulse a laser in and a few come back. Our system collects up, upwards to a billion on the same time scale, 800 million. Keep in mind that all these advances are being made via the mission of making brain data mainstream. The team has successfully scaled a former medical technology and made it cheaper, more accessible, and according to Brian, get 1,000 times more information than current systems. The helmet connects via a single USB-C cable and doesn't need any external energy supply. It has also shown consistent results from preliminary studies comparable to state-of-the-art devices on the market. One of the cool aspects of Flow is that there's a lot of research being conducted related to sleep, impulse control, and even psychedelics as promising treatment for depression and other brain-related challenges. It demonstrates the potential of a technology that makes neuroscience closer to the people in an accessible way. If you're wondering about how each of us might use the device, Kernel released this video sharing some applications they expect. 
The first is a clip of Brian going into the kitchen to eat some presumably sugary cereal. His kernel flow device notifies him that making good dietary decisions is currently challenging. He then elects to eat a more bland cereal. Many of the applications of kernel's flow are yet to come, but it's clear that Brian has the ambition of putting a kernel helmet in every home by 2033. He and the team have deployed 50 production prototypes to universities and labs that are working on promising applications. In particular, one application that excites me more than the craving control application is speech and song detection highlighted on the company website. Kernel has demonstrated the ability to infer what a person is listening to from brain signals alone. Here's a clip of this in action. For the audio listeners only, this clip is pretty cool, so perhaps consider transitioning over to YouTube. The same research and development used for this sound detection technique is found in Kernel's other product, Flux. The approach is called magnetoencephalography, or MEG, which is also a non-invasive approach that measures the magnetic fields produced by the brain's electrical currents to estimate neural activity. Here is a video from the technical presentation from March of 2021 by Ethan Pratt, a team lead at Kernel, showing his brain signals in real time with high accuracy. Like Kernel's Flow product, Kernel Flux will help society understand the brain better. The difference between these two products, however, is that Flow is a wearable headset used to establish precise patterns of brain activity. The team's delivered serial number one, but it's expected to be more widely available in Q2 2022 for research and consumer markets. Flux, however, is not just a headset. Instead, it's a platform for institutions that might otherwise pursue existing MEG systems. Kernel is one of the leading companies advancing the field of brain-computer interfaces. I encourage you to check out their website since they're looking for candidates in many disciplines like neuroscience, manufacturing, engineering, and more. According to LinkedIn data, they've been growing consistently over the past few years and continue to have job postings available. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Write in the comments what you think about Kernel. Will they rule the future of BCIs? My name is Ryan Tanaka, and I hope to catch you at the next episode. Thanks for watching. If you're interested in helping us grow Neuropod, please go to www.patreon.com slash neuropod, or clicking the join button below the video. Your support helps us increase the quantity and quality of our videos. Thanks again.